I have a confession to make. And you hated it. I didn't hate it. I fucking love her so much. <laughs> Backfired on you, Joey. No one wants to hear their mom fucking. That's just... I have my therapy bill, please. <laughs> I don't care if you rip my spine out to make it better. Bro, Whoa. so fucking funny. <laughs> it is fucking wild. And they bang. They bang, they bang. Ugh, so annoying. Get over it. <laughs> Let the record show, I was here on time today. Yes. Huh. Good job. I know. I did my job. <laughs> you showed up. Did you read the Physically. book? Yes, I read the book. Okay. Well, and don't you say, of course. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you did your job. You showed up. Did you read the book? See, those are your jobs. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not an of course anymore. So we have to check these things. Yeah. I have a confession to make. Great actually had not read Lucy score before this. Okay. And I know that she is very hyped up in a lot of places. And you hated it. I didn't hate it, but I definitely expected more. Oh, great. There was typo problems. There was continuity things. There's timeline things. So this entire episode, if you don't want to hear Ariel talk shit about Lucy no, score, it wasn't probably that bad. get the fuck out. No, it wasn't that bad. I was just surprised for somebody who's so hyped up that I was expecting a higher tier was all. I mean, it came across as being a bitch, so. I know, but I know so many people rave about Lucy's score. I like a lot of her books. I like the Knock Em Out series a lot. So, anywho, yes, this week we went on the journey of finding Lucy's score. Ariel did. I, I've already yeah, read Lucy's gonna, score. I've read many you, of her books. The story was cute. When I do get into rom-coms, I do really like that small town vibe. I really like the community vibe. And this one was fun with the farm stuff. But yes, so this week we read No More Secrets by Lucy Score. And it is the first book in the Blue Moon series. Yeah. And there's eight books in that series. Eight? Wow. I just assumed mm -hmm. it would be the Three Brothers. Yeah, there's eight of them. Wow. I didn't look into it clearly, but. I mean, it's right on the front page of Amazon. I'm just, wow. Yeah. I wonder. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Maybe we get the Russians book. So that would be. We've got a couple. Four. We have, obviously, Jax. Beckett's That's next. Beckett yeah. and Jax. Then Nikolai. They're the Russian, yep. Then Donovan, then Innkeeper Eden, and Davis, then so John just Pierce more people from the town. Then there was a book where it all began, which is John Pierce and Phoebe. Oh. So their original story. That's number. Eight. And then there's a Christmas one. Is it kind of like a little novella? Ryan Sosa and Saint Doctor Sammy. Oh no. And then the and so that's the break. All right. Well, our story. Features Summer and Carter, and it is a small town farm romance. I will say, when I read the description, for some reason, my brain thought when they said hippy dippy blue moon, that blue moon was a person. It's not, for the record. It's a place. Yeah. When I read it, I was like, oh, okay. Listen, when you've heard of people like, I'm going to make a really reference here, you're not going to understand, but Aaron Rodgers, who is a football player. Yeah. He had a girlfriend named Blue of the Earth. That was her name. Like Nisi Ivy Blue Green. Moon? Like, what, what was it? it? Ivy Green? Blue like Ivy. in that other book? It's... Oh, in that oh, other book? Oh, that too. <laughs> yes, Ivy Green. Blue Ivy's Beyonce's daughter, but that's besides the point. Right. So seeing Blue Moon, I was like, okay, because yeah. Hippy Dippy, yeah. Hippy Dippy Blue Moon. And it, it's capitalist. I was like, okay, it's a person. It's not a person. Anywho. <laughs> yeah, anywho. So, Summer... Our FMC is heading to the country for a week, Blue Moon Bend to be exact. Summer is an associate editor for a very bustling magazine and is being sent on an assignment. Though truth be told, while she could probably use a break of fresh air and a slower pace, she's worried about all she'll miss in the big city while she's gone. 
This book is third person POV and it switches between the FMC and the MMC views mid chapter super annoyingly. See, it didn't bother me that much because there was a page break every time it happened. Yeah, so it didn't do it automatically. It so didn't, it didn't have any labeling and it was mid chapter, which I know we've both complained a lot about in other books. And it was just frustrating. I've complained about it when I didn't know who it was switching to, but they put the name like immediately right yeah, there. Yeah. So it yeah. wasn't that difficult. It wasn't right. It wasn't as difficult to find, but it, I hate when they do it like mid chapter like that. It's frustrating. So Carter, who we learn from the POV switch, is our MMC, and he has been tasked with showing Summer around for the week at his farm. He greets her. She's surprised at the massive model-looking farmer, and he gives her a tour of the house. She starts in right away, peppering with questions. She asks about crops and animals and his hours. Ready to be done with questions for now, Carter offers to bring in her bags and move her car. Turning on the car to move it, the song she had on starts playing again, and it just happens to be a favorite of his. He wonders if this is some sort of sign. He heads back in and shows Summer to her room. He explains that his mom is coming by in a bit and doing dinner for them, along with his brother. Both his brother and his mom help out part-time on the farm, and that he will give her a farm tour the next day. While waiting for dinner, Summer starts a behind-the-scenes blog to help generate buzz, for the upcoming article, even snapping a picture of Carter to include. Carter's mom, Phoebe, arrives next in a flurry of supplies and gets working on dinner, with Summer pitching in to help. Carter makes it down from the shower in time to save Summer from her abysmal chopping skills. Apparently she's not that great in the kitchen. <laughs> and Carter's brother, Beckett, arrives. Carter does not like the eyes Beckett is making at Summer. Beckett teases him. Like, what are you calling, dibs? And Carter says, yes, if that keeps your eyes off her. They sit down for spaghetti when a knock comes from the side door. Joey, Carter's full-time horse caretaker, is joining them. And Joey has this, like, weird vibe with Summer, like she's being territorial of the family, and it's really standoffish. After dinner, Phoebe breaks out old albums so Summer can get a feel for the farm's early days, and we learn that Joey and Jackson used to be a thing when they were young, but it ended poorly. Jackson is Carter's other brother, so there's Carter, Jackson, and Beckett are the brothers. The next morning, Summer meets Carter downstairs in her sparkly jeans and brand new work boots, ready for a tour and hands-on helping for the day, hoping to get a good start getting to know him and the place for her piece. Carter warns her about the boots and that it might not be a good idea to wear those brand new boots for the day, but she assures him she'll be fine. They don't make it very far out the back door when a goat scares the crap out of Summer and bites a hole right through her pants. <laughs> Clementine is the name of the goat and Clementine features pretty heavily throughout the book and it's cute. After calming down, Summer takes a selfie with Clementine and Carter. Apparently, this is his first selfie ever, which is kind of weird, but okay, for her blog, and they move on. <laughs> they get into Carter's Jeep and drive down to tour the stables. Summer even gets to give their newest rescue an apple as a treat. Then they find Joey, and when she finds out that Summer has never ridden a horse, well, she decides now is the time, and she kind of does it almost deceptively, like, because she's still feeling summer out and doesn't think it's probably a good thing for her to be there summer was scared at first but it didn't take long for excitement to take over and to enjoy the experience it's backfired on you joey after the stables they drove around the rest of the property touring the fields barn pond and creek summer even befriends two pet pigs they don't have a ton of animals on the farm because this is not a meat producing farm any of the animals that are on the farm are pets or for riding, this farm is all vegan, including the owners. They break for lunch and a chance for questions. Summer asks about the farm being organic and the horse program. Carter's pleased that the questions seem mostly ease in and nothing too prying. After lunch, they join Beckett and another part-time employee at the lettuce field to harvest it. Summer dives into the task. Sure, she's ready to tackle this like she has anything else she's been given. Three hours later, the field is harvested, and Summer is a very sore, very exhausted puddle. She admits it was harder than she thought, but Carter tells her she did a good job, 
It was her first time. He tells her it's time to head back. They'll get showered off and get ready and they can go out to get dinner. Back at the house, it's been a bit and Carter still hasn't heard the shower come on upstairs. So he goes to check on Summer. She's face down on the bed, blistered feet hanging off, unable to move. Carter gets her some pain reliever and tea and asks if it's okay if he rubs her back, thinking she has a back spasm. She's basically like anything, please. I don't care if you rip my spine out to make it better. Best intentions, though. He realizes he spent the afternoon unintentionally torturing her, and now she's returning the favor as he sits above her, rubbing down her back. Every noise she makes as he's fixing the situation is a cruel joke. When he's done, he puts a heat pack on her lower back and gets some gel and bandages for her feet. When Summer is able to finally get up and get to the shower, the hot water helps the rest and makes her feel mostly human again. She gets ready and meets Carter downstairs so that they can head out. Carter makes a pit stop on their way and finds Summer a pair of boots that won't hurt her feet. At the boot store, though, are the two worst town busybodies, apparently. Though they prefer to think of themselves as matchmakers and boast a 100% success rate. And now they have their sights set on Summer and Carter. And Carter is like, holy shit. Summer thinks this whole thing and Carter's reactions are hilarious. And the whole thing is pretty funny. The characters in this town are a treat. The clerk who thinks she's psychic even cracks a soulmate joke as they check out with the shoes. <laughs> Summer is enamored as they get deeper into the town to get to the pizza place. Apparently, a couple dozen people got lost on their way back from Woodstock and settled there, meshing with the tiny farming town, turning it into the quirky hippie farm paradise it is now. That is the funniest backstory for a I town I have <laughs> in my life. And I love it. I know. The town itself was... It was great. I loved the, I loved that. The matchmakers who call themselves the beautification committee to beautify the town with love is way ahead of them and has already hijacked the pizza place ahead of them. They are escorted to a table way in the back, secluded and alone. And everyone seems to know Summer's name. Yes. (laughs) While they wait for their pizza, Summer asks Carter questions about his choice to be a vegetarian, which leads her to ask why he's not taken yet he's clearly the full package he kind of asks her the same and it's cute they're a little back and forth and it's super cute until the food arrives interrupting them the next morning summer is woken up by the sounds of a scuffle she heads downstairs to find carter and jackson going at each other because jackson was breaking in the door is literally always unlocked unannounced at the crack of dawn Summer's appearance snaps them both out of it, and she heads to the kitchen to get them both ice. Beckett comes barreling through the door next, having received a text to come over from Jackson. They need to come together and get to the bottom of a crisis. So Jackson, up until this moment, was living in California. So he has flown home and is now home, and now they have a crisis to unfold. Yeah. He peaced the fuck out right after graduation and just left everybody. I was like, mm-hmm. bye. There was some kind of accident. You've been gone for eight years. And like there was some kind of accident involving him and Joey, and this is how him and Joey broke up. And he hasn't been home since, and except he for didn't holidays. He so just break up with her as just leave the goddamn state. Yeah, <laughs> and he hasn't been back except for like holidays and birthdays and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like a coward. But there's a crisis. They need to handle this now. So he's back. Apparently, their mother is sneaking around with a new man. Their mother, by the way, is amazing, <laughs> and I. Fucking love her so much. And now that they have circled up, it's time to go confront her. They storm off to Phoebe's house, who's all like, who, me? What are you talking about? While the dude is climbing down from the front porch roof, the boys catch him and haul him inside. It's Franklin. Not like, hey, it's Franklin coming over to play. That's all I could think of the whole fucking time. So now he's a turtle, just so you know. I really hope he's not a turtle in bed, too. Good thing he's a fictional character. (laughs) So they know him. Apparently, he owns the Italian restaurant in town. Carter tells Phoebe to start talking, and she decides that they will all chat over breakfast since they're there anyways. So they all have breakfast together. 
back at the farm, apparently Jackson is staying a bit, which is kind of odd because he usually only comes for holidays and stuff, but Joey is stunned to see him and none too happy about it. Jackson kisses her upon seeing her again, earning him quite the slap to the face and a storm away. Done with her task for the day, Summer wants to head into town and pick up more jeans without goat bites. Jackson, when hearing about her plans, asks to tag along. They head to the store, and they both find some jeans and a busybody before Carter calls, who doesn't seem pleased with their outing together. They agree to pick up dinner on the way home to curb the beast. They even make a stop at an organic juice store, and Summer stocks up after trying one of them. Back at the farm, it's they all so sit- fucking cute too. <laughs> yeah. Back at the farm, they all sit down to eat their subs and try all the juice that Summer brought back. Most of the juices are pretty good until they get to one that is particularly horrible. And Summer and Carter have a cutesy little chase and catch moment around the yard as she tries to make him suffer and drink it too. He finally relents and says, "Fine, but you'll owe me." After drinking it. She just know, laughs. He knows what all of these actually taste like because he yes. supplies everything. And he, su- yeah, yeah. She just laughs at him and says, just try to collect with a wink and walks off. And I thought that was going to go somewhere in the story. Like he was going to collect sometime, but it never actually went anywhere. So that was a bummer. By day, Summer joins in on helping out on the farm and then works on her blog in the evenings. One of those evenings, she approaches Carter with a merchandising idea, since he doesn't seem to have much in terms of branding or even a logo. And if they had t-shirts or reusable bags with something, she could add it to the blog posts and it would help them. She shows him <clears throat> she shows him a logo idea and he likes it and the merchandising idea. Another one of the evenings, Summer is particularly sucked into work mode, dealing with call after call all dealing with some sort of magazine crisis. Carter is like, nope, and tells her time for a break. Be ready in five minutes. Five minutes later, they're climbing into the car and Carter drives them to the stables, saying they are going for a ride. She's worried because it's getting pretty late, but he assures her all will be well and he will keep her safe. And it's just kind of a little moment for her. And she feels like she wants to kiss him and he feels like he wants to kiss her, but neither of them are brave enough to make the move. So they ride and it's a peaceful, beautiful ride until they stop to watch the sunset where Summer reaches over and slips her hand into Carter's grasp, ending out the evening. Farm life doesn't stop for Saturdays, though. So Summer finds herself up early and put to work, even on the weekend. Phoebe comes to help hand out packed up produce for their subscribers. One of them mentions another farmer that had an accident and needs help until his family can arrive. As much of a gossip mill the town can be, they do come together for each other in times of need. So Sunday, the next morning, almost the whole town shows up to this farmer's place, obviously, along with Summer and Carter and his whole family. By evening, the harvest was done, and the house and lawn cleaned up, and the old farmer set up for a week of meals. Food and drinks were delivered by local places, and it turned into some sort of town picnic with everybody there. The sense of community is very overwhelming for Summer. Carter finds her and she confesses about her lack of community and even the strained relationship she has with her parents. How her dad basically doesn't want much to do with her simply because she didn't want to have the exact same job as him. Carter says that she's now an honorary mooner, that this group won't let anyone be alone. Carter says the town helped him a lot when he came back from the service, full of bullet holes and PTSD. Everyone helped him transition back into farm life and running the farm, and he's very grateful. He says back then he was angry and scared all the time, but he learned that they were all stronger together. Summer asks how he feels now, and he runs his fingers through her hair and says, let's find out, and he kisses her. Summer asks him to take her home. They barely make it back into the driveway (laughs) before they're attacking each other's faces again. When Summer reaches down to touch him that spurs carter out of the car in a hurry but they can only make it to the porch before summer sinks to her knees and sucks him into her mouth i mean okay he barely gets her off in time telling her not yet and hauls her onto the porch swing shedding her of her boots and jeans he goes down on her and then picks her up and carries her up to his bedroom instructing her to lose the shirt and bra along the way He tosses her onto the bed, 
and loses his own clothing, and without any talk of condoms or birth control, he tackles her and slides home. They do realize their mistake mid-go, though, and Carter is frustrated that he was so swept up and not thinking. He runs to the bathroom to grab a condom, and just in time, because neither of them last very long. Summer drifts off to sleep, and Carter's mind buzzes with thoughts that this is something special. Definitely no fling. He falls asleep, thinking he could see a future with her. In the middle of the night, Summer helps Carter out of a nightmare, and they dissipate the residual emotions of it by going another round. The next morning, Carter wakes up grateful that Summer was able to help him combat the darkness through the night, and he isn't waking for the day miserable like he usually does after he has a nightmare. Summer stirs, and they head down for breakfast. Summer wants to talk about things, what it means, what this is. Carter says there's no way that she's leaving after this week without a plan to see each other again. She seems pleased by this, but... I would like to point out that time is very abstract in this book. I don't know how many days are in one of their weeks, but in the real world, we have seven days in a week, and there has been way more than seven days thus far, and she still has more to go. I swear she was only there for the weekend. She was only supposed to be there for seven days, but they've had way more than seven days, and then she still has two more days to go. Gotcha. I had assumed that she was only there for the weekend. Time is very abstract in this book, and it was crazy. Just saying. Anywho, so they agree not to see anyone else and say that it's an exploratory stage of a relationship. So they should keep things private just for them for now. They kiss and jump apart when the door bursts open. Jax says he's moving in. He's done with having to listen to their mom and her boyfriend through the wall. Bro, so fucking funny. <laughs> but then he drops Summer's boots and jeans on the counter and says he found those outside and then grumbles about everyone having sex around here but him. So I'm sorry. So you go to one, you, you left one place and then you come to another. To <laughs> I, okay. So I guess there has to be a difference between. Hearing your mother fuckers is hearing your brother fucking. You know what I mean? He's like, I need to choose the lesser of two evils. (laughs) No, (laughs) no one wants to hear their mom fucking. That's just, I have my therapy bill, please. (laughs) Right. So Carter tells him that he can figure out why the tractor's stalling out after breakfast and that he can get some work done and earn his keep. And Joey shows up to grab coffee and instantly clocks the summer carter vibe and now they're basically like what the fuck (laughs) so much for secrecy and Jax asks joey if she wants to join the brothers who are going to play poker that night and she scrambles and says that she can't because she's going out with summer you know the one who she's been super standoffish with the whole time but summer covers for her though it's obvious the girl's girl right though it is obvious to everyone She's literally avoiding this man. Right. And that Summer's just like, ah, we do have. (laughs) So later, as the boys are showing up for poker, Joey picks up Summer for their outing. Jackson shares with his brothers that coming back has been on his mind for a while. And he wants to turn one of the old barns that doesn't get used into a brewery pub. He wants to do it together with them. They agree to think about it. Joey brings Summer to the local bar where they chat and have a drink until a reporter for the town's monthly circular tries to interview them both about their love lives. He's third generation beautification committee. So it's, he's just going to make up whatever he wants. I love this beautification committee though. Right? I, I think we could just have a TV show just about them. They quickly leave and Joey drives them back to her house. They hang and have dinner and chat. And after Summer gets dropped back off at the house, She leaves the boys to their game and heads upstairs to work, only to find all of her stuff moved out of the room that she had been staying, and it all moved into Carter's bedroom. Well, I liked that. That was cute. Man knows what he wants. Yeah. Very rare for a dude. The next morning, Summer wakes Carter up by going down on him, and then they bang, and then they go back to sleep, having a nice lazy morning in bed that Carter had to pay Jax $50 to arrange so that they could sleep in until 10 a.m. And they bang. They bang. They bang. Pulling it out of my playbook, apparently. Phoebe planned them all to get together for dinner and grill for Summer's last evening 
before she needed to head back for work. They all have a lovely meal together, though, and Summer gifts them all t-shirts with a new logo on them, and she assures them that she will be back next month for the photo shoot. The next morning comes too quickly, and Carter and Summer struggle to part. They agree to talk on the phone that evening and that this is just a see you soon, not a goodbye. So the next two weeks have Summer bogged down at work. She and Carter managed to squeeze two very short overnight visits in that time frame at a hotel halfway between them. The third week, Carter is able to come visit her for the weekend, and she brings him along as her date to a work event at an art gallery, where he gets to see her in action at work and with her coworkers. Carter even has a moment where he threatens a model in the bathroom for grabbing Summer's ass. It's I love that so much. I know. <sighs> it's It's nice. I like to see his little come out <laughs> you think <laughs> <laughs> they head back to summer's place and eat takeout together and she tells him about her dream to create and run her own online magazine about real life and real people not all the stuff that she's surrounded by now carter has another nightmare while staying at summer's again she helps him wake through it but this time he's ready to share he tells her what his nightmare is about and his time in the service and how he tried to save this little girl and couldn't and how he got shot and it's just a recurring nightmare for him summer tells carter that she knows it's too soon but that she loves him him opening up to her just solidifies that for her he says what took you so long that he's loved her almost as long as he's known her he was just waiting for her to catch up summer wakes in a panic though because it's after eight and she needs to take her meds he hands them to her saying she had an alert on her phone. But that doesn't make any sense because they slept until after 10 that other morning with no issues or meds or panic. But whatever. Again, know, lack of continuity. Anyways, Summer is panicking that Carter's going to find out about whatever it is she's taking meds for. We don't even know what it is at this point either. So there's also that. He just says that she can tell him when she's ready because he's a good doobie. They spend the weekend enjoying each other, going to dinner, movies, and even a baseball game. They just have a nice weekend together. And the next week she was supposed to, I know. And the next week she was supposed to get a couple days away to visit Carter at his house, but a work event came up, leaving them both frustrated. The following week is finally photo shoot week, and she is definitely going to be there for that. So Summer heads down early the night before for some extra Carter time. Summer helps them set up for their market the next morning, just in time for the photographer to arrive. The photographer is also her work BFF. So it's nice. After finishing at the market, they and which again, the market is full of like all the blue moon characters. And every time we get that sense of community, that sense of blue moon characters, it's just, I don't know. That's I that's kind of my favorite part of the book is all that kind of stuff it's just it's cute yeah i nice. loved it after finishing at the market they go back to the farm so the farm can be photographed for the afternoon everyone gets busy doing chores while the photographer goes off taking pictures and doing his thing until weeding and watering the garden becomes a flirty war with the hose between carter and summer and summer jumps on carter's back so he runs her into the cold pond they start making out, taking things further, except they don't have a condom on them. And apparently they don't care this time. So that's interesting. And it doesn't, they never talk about it again. The next day, the local wild child daycare comes to the farm for a field trip day. So there's this local daycare that all their hippie parents send them to that they all believe that none of these kids should be told no ever. So none of the town will let them go on field trips to their farms except for Carter. He's the only one brave enough to let them come. And it is fucking wild. These children are rabid animals, basically. Bro, right? <laughs> Can't even do certain things anymore because I just love his solution. I fucking cackled so loud. So it was chaos until Carter showed them the fenced in pig pen and let them run wild. And they just shut them in this pen. <laughs> just put the kids in pen and just shut it. <laughs> but the kids had a grand old time. They, they were did, running around so and Carter's on the other side of the fence going, 
what does the cow say? So then they're running around going, Meh. Didn't they make oh. a comment about, do you think the parents would be okay with this if we just called it free range? Uh-huh. Set one up at their, at their oh daycare. <laughs> Great. So after they leave, as everyone is just basically lying there decompressing because it's just, they're all just wiped. Carter makes a comment to Summer about how their kids will never behave like that. And Summer has to excuse herself and go find Joey to try to hold off the panic that this brings on. And Joey's basically like, well, yeah, he probably wants kids because, I mean, look at him. He has a family, a big family. He probably does. Maybe you should talk to him about this. Like, because Summer's like, well, does he even want kids? Like, what, 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 what? And she's like, are you pregnant? She's like, no, but I, I don't even know if I can, even what, have kids? Like, and Summer just walks off in a daze and she just decides to go for a walk. When she spots Carter in her path, she tells him that they are moving too fast, that they want different things, that this is just not working. Carter tries to protest, but she tells him she needs space. She needs time. And she runs back to the house and leaves. They make sure to let her work BFF, the photographer, know that she left and make sure that he's going to check in with her when he gets back. But on Carter's side of things, Carter's family rallies around him, keeping him in hopeful, distracted spirits. They even make headway on the brewery plans. Summer is trying to use work as a distraction until her work BFF does come back and confront her. We now learn that Summer is fairly newly in remission from cancer. That is what she's been hiding from him this whole time and thinks that it's not going to last. She has more tests coming up. And she's afraid to hope because this test will let her know if she's actually in fully remission or not. How can she plan a future with Carter when she might not even have one? But her BFF reminds her that no one is guaranteed anything. I mean, you could walk out and get hit by a bus. Like that's not, you can't live like that. And when the final of the magazine comes across Summer's desk, she finds her beautiful article about sustainability and community has been replaced by three paragraphs showcasing the sexy hot bachelors working a farm. And it's all basically like a dating ad. She's outraged and goes straight to her boss. Her boss reminds her that she is the boss and that this is what people really want. Summer cries out that it has her name on it. Her boss says she should be thanking her. Summer yells, I quit. She goes home and pours her heart and soul and her entire story into her blog. Her ambitions at work, to meeting Carter, to things changing, to the cancer, to the fake article, all of it. Professing her apologies and love for Carter and ending it with her actual piece that she wrote. The next morning, she wakes up late, barely in time to get to her oncology appointment, Oh, look, no weird panic at 10 a.m. for meds, though. Just point that out. I mean, she's going to the doctor, so I mean. Say it. It's not okay for her to wake up at 8 a.m., but it's okay for her to wake up 10 a.m. twice. She goes to her appointment and gets the good news. She's good. Full remission. But she's surprised to find Carter waiting for her outside the building. He read the blog. They hug and kiss and make up and acknowledge that the beautification committee is going to be very happy. <laughs> he tells her that he tried calling her like 10 times and she realizes that her phone was on silent and her phone is blowing the fuck up from this article. She asks him to take her home to Blue Moon home. So then we skip to two weeks later and Summer is being flooded with emails of people and organizations that want to work with her and her online magazine idea and help that become a reality. Summer has moved in and Summer's parents show up for a visit that we don't actually see or have any resolution for. Then we have an epilogue and Summer and Carter are now married. It takes a few pages and some math to find out that it's been four years five years of remission, and that they have three-year-old twins. So I wonder if that time in the lake is what did it. Probably. Probably. And that is our story. So for me, I loved the concept of Blue Moon. 
And I loved the beautification committee. I was totally sold on all of that. And I liked the farm life stuff. It was the writing and the this timing spacing and the continuity that I had issues with for the actual concept of the story. Yeah. No, it was good. And then, of course, like, once again, having another book with shitty parents. Her dad sucks. Yeah, but we and we didn't actually get any resolution we, to it because it was like, oh, they're well, arriving we learned, on their porch. I mean, we learned. I meant more so like we learned why her and her dad didn't get along. Her dad basically doesn't want much to do with her simply because she didn't want to have the exact same job as he, did. which is crazy to me that like it's, why it's not. I've I mean, I've heard that especially especially with get journalism. I mean, get over it, please. But that the mother just stood by and was like, yep, all good. You understand that these people do exist. I know it's just shitty. But so, (laughs) but that is more reason why we needed more of a resolution to the other than the Carter arranged for them to show up on the porch. And she's just like, oh, thank you. And then we get nothing. Yeah, I get that. To me, that was baloney. It was. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. The timing was like really weird. I already knew that it was going to be cancer. Like the minute, like she mentioned something. I like Nikolai a lot though, because he like was like, bitch, I right. know these things. And like, she, BFF, he was yeah. Telling her, like, yo, you know, yeah. let fucking people in. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. He was a good little. Even her doctor was like, I told you, I didn't I love like how her doctor was like her little champion. Like, well, the doctor she was also like, there, I was not appreciating. She, the doctor was she like, just suffered in silence and worked through the whole thing and mm-hmm. had no support system. Yeah. But she yeah, walked was... in that appointment and they're like, we read your blog. It was so cute. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I like the Lucy Scores newer books a lot because I don't even think, I don't even know when one of the other books I had read had come out. Well, was this her first one? Was this her debut? No, this is not. Oh. No, her first book was written in like 2015. So I was trying to see if I had those are just the blue moon cards. So that's not, yeah, no more secrets. 2016. So, I mean, it is pretty one of her earlier works. So there, I don't think she had very many out gotcha. when she wrote this one. So, like I said, I like the characters, I like the story. It was just the, the writing flow for me. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had Clementine, the MVP. <laughs> okay, go. I love that. Oh, man. Well, so then I guess we can get into favorite. Okay, who's your favorite character? Clementine. Uh, yeah. This is the goat. I liked, I liked Cl- and honestly. Um, I really enjoyed Carter. I liked Carter, but I liked his mom but I, so much. And I also enjoyed Beckett. I So I didn't really mm-hmm. talk much about Beckett or Jackson a ton because this wasn't their story. They have their own books. But Beckett is the mayor. And, he's the mayor um, and the lawyer of the town. <laughs> yes, he's the mayor and the lawyer of the town. So people just randomly show up and just expect him to fix all their problems for free, mind you. So he's got all these just people that just come to him and just expect them to even fix their marriage squabbles. And it's hilarious. And I think his book would just be really funny because it would probably be filled with all of the town mm-hmm. issues and stuff. So. I like that. I, it was great. I, I liked that a lot. He was very funny. I just, I enjoyed when Beckett was on page. Yes. Yeah, Beckett was good. I liked him a lot. Who was your least favorite? Probably Summer's dad. Just yeah. because, He's obviously. Shit. Yeah. Ugh, so annoying. Get over it. <laughs> and just, yeah. Oh, goodness. Okay. So let me pull this up. Okay. So. Amazon gives it a 4.4 and Goodreads is a 4.2. Solid nuggets. When did you give it? I rated it three and a half stars. I enjoyed the story concept and I enjoyed the characters, but I needed more from the actual writing. Gotcha. I gave it a four. I loved it. I had a great time. I enjoyed the story itself. Yeah. I just needed more continuity. It's fine. And about- resolutions. Yeah. How about a cucumber? I gave it three. I like a four. Oh. I liked what was there. I mean, it, yeah. realistically, like, they're not, like, folk. This is not a sex. No. <laughs> and, right. 
I, and at I least we got it. descriptions. Yeah. And it Are wasn't you kidding me? Door. I was there for the, yeah, I, I was, was there for the up. blue moon characters. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> How about survivability, Ariel? I would definitely survive. I am hit or Especially miss. Especially since I don't wear jeans much. Okay. No. So I'm hit or so miss. Clementine wouldn't beat me. <laughs> I'm hit or miss with it only because I probably would have killed Carter after he made me cut all of those heads of lettuce. I would have uh, murdered him. And think? then I'd be in jail. He let her do that for ever like three Knowing hours that it's back break work i would have killed him i would i would see i would have been just as stubborn as her and done it i would have been stubborn and done it but then if i had found out that he did it on purpose i would have killed him instantly killed him it's what needed to be harvested next he did it on purpose he just openly admitted what, he did it on purpose. he was just trying to see what she was made out of and she got a massage out of it great doesn't matter <laughs> it all worked out in the end I, i'd be good i'd be good okay well what are we doing next week let's find out let's find out Beach. let's find out what's next because i am oh did i tell you so funny story so i was at school a little bit ago and almost the end of the year and we were talking about how this whole school year has been insane and i have had to be pulled in so many different directions and the person i was talking to was just saying like their role is so ambiguous and i was like really what's my role then am i just like the school bitch and she's just like yeah yeah you're the school bitch and i was like yeah in every sense of the word right i am just the school bitch so i think i should have that on a t-shirt the school bitch <laughs> you yeah i mean <laughs> you're not wrong <laughs> that was funny that's funny all righty Let's <clears throat> let's spin this and see what the wheel of fate has in store for us next week. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that sound was for, but here we are. <laughs> Alrighty, a very bossy billionaire. All right, and I believe this was a book that I brought to the table. It sounds like it's me. <laughs> it sounds like a you book. You're right. <laughs> so. It is a uh, very bossy billionaire, a workplace romance standalone by Scarlett Avery. I'm the boss. Those are the last three words I wanted to hear from a stranger. I stood up on a second date without the courtesy of a call. In the land of the size zero supermodel, as a plus size woman, I don't often catch the attention of a man that makes my toes curl. To add to the decadent encounter, the illegally hot stranger with a sexy British accent and dreamy hazel brown eyes wants to see me again. Finally, finally, I get to break my one-time coffee date curse. Standing up Mr. Suit on our second date is the biggest Shakespearean tragedy ever. I didn't mean to be a no-show. It was out of my control. Losing my phone was the nail in my coffin. A week later, arriving at my new job and coming face-to-face -face with him counts as one of the worst days of my life. That's until I discover he's the boss. Turns out, my boss doesn't appreciate being stood up without the courtesy of a call or a text. And boy, the man holds a grudge. Mr. Suit is determined to make me pay. Note to self, hell hath no fury like a boss scorn. Sounds like he's a little emotional. He should probably get that checked. <laughs> oh, man. So we're going to switch into some billionaire stuff. Ooh. And a boss romance like Crystal uh. Legs. I love it. I don't know why. I, I don't, don't either, but I know you like it. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's I'm like, like I, I'll give or take it. It's not, it's just not like, I'm not like, oh, you I know why? Like you do. Okay. So I think, so the thing is, is I love a good enemies to lovers. Yeah. And a lot of boss like romance nice ones stuff. end up being enemies to lovers. And gotcha. so it just kind of falls into that trope that I really enjoy. So, I mean, Sounds good. Yeah. Right. So join us next week and we'll yes. dive into some billionaire romance. Read along with us and make sure to keep reading. And keep it smutty. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>